Good evening. So it gives me great privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Devdas Menon Sir. Dr. Devdas Menon Sir is presently the Institute Chair Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at uh, IIT Madras. Sir is engaged in teaching, research and consultancy in structural engineering. He is developing a holistic approach in education with emphasis on inner development and transformation. He teaches two popular elective courses at IIT Madras, namely the Self-Awareness and the Integral Karma Yoga. Professor conducts workshops for students, students and corporate organizations on finding meaning and fulfillment in life. Sir is the author of a number of books, namely Spirituality at Work, The Inspiring Message of Bhagavad Gita and Stop Sleep Walking to Life, uh, published by Yogi Impression. My hearty welcome to you, sir. Uh, we are extremely thrilled to have you with us today. We are looking forward for your great session, sir. The stage is all yours. Thank you. Namaste. Can you all hear me? See me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see you. Yes, sir. So, first of all, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Ragita and Dr. Lata for uh, inviting me to uh, share some thoughts with you. Uh, Ragita and Lata are members of a small satsang group we have here on self-inquiry, which I conduct online once a week. And the discussions are primarily on Atma Vichara, self inquiry. And uh, I was wondering whether some of that might be useful to you. My respectful regards to all of you. You are teachers of psychology, a much needed knowledge for all of us. And uh, the topic that we are going to now discuss is uh, really getting to the heart of everything. Usually, a topic like this, Tattva Masi, is uh, taught from an academic or uh, philosophical perspective. But, and I understand that many of you here are here because you want to be able to learn and teach uh, the so-called Indian psychology, which is the psychology found in the Indian traditions, in the, uh, say in the Vedantic tradition, the Buddhist tradition, the Jain tradition, uh, Sikh tradition, and even the Sufi tradition. But uh, it would be nice to take, take off the robe of the academic, and to be a simple human being and to really listen and try to assimilate this from a simple perspective. We are all human beings and uh, our primary need, I think we will all agree, is to be happy and at peace, have well-being and uh, to not suffer. Keeping that goal in mind, let us listen. Now, in the Indian tradition, the word for listening is Shravana. And Shravana is not just hearing with the ears. It's a deep listening. It's a listening that, if done well, can actually help us access the goal that we have in mind. And it is that kind of listening that was expected of the student in the Upanishads. Now the Upanishads belong to uh, the Vedas, the Vedic tradition. The bulk of the Vedas are devoted to what is referred to as the Karma Kand. It's all about doing uh, in order to gain happiness. 
And as you know, in the Indian tradition, it was recognized that what we mostly need is security. And the word for that is artha. Security in terms of obviously uh, basic needs, which uh, we in our common parlance say roti, kapra, makan. Financial security to begin with. But then also security in terms of emotional relationships, security in terms of status, name and fame, security in terms of power and also, and this belongs to all the religious traditions, security in the afterlife. These were the primary concerns. And this, and for this there were lots of recommendations, lots of practices, lots of rituals, which many people still carry out. So that is one fundamental human need, artha, the need for all kinds of security. For an academic in today's world, especially in places like IIT, that would translate as getting your papers published, having citations. And that's all in which your name is there. That's all security. That's needed for a promotion and so on. So it's, it's the... Even though it deals with knowledge, it's actually very materialistic in its uh, deeper content. The second need is uh, the need for pleasure, need for entertainment, need for fun, need for uh, to overcome boredom. And that's a huge need and you can see that's a very major need for most of us today. When we keep scanning the internet and uh, look at the mobile phone restlessly all the time, we are looking for our attention to be captured by something interesting. Unfortunately, nothing lasts long. And so we keep seeking this need for pleasure. And that group of needs is broadly called karma. So these are the two primary needs. But unfortunately, in our effort to fulfill these needs, we uh, often break the rules, we often do things that are prohibited by our religions. Uh, we ideally should be following uh, dharma. Now, dharma is also a need, uh, it reflects a need for virtue, for being good. A uh, uh, very important need. And uh, sometimes we refer to, we resort to a dharma. Now, in an academic setting, you know very well uh, how students copy in assignments and uh, how corruption is so rampant in our society. So, uh, why do we resort to a dharma? Because we want artha and kama and we can't wait, we want it fast, and we want it before others get what they want. Now, all this is supposed to make us happy and not make us suffer. Now, the student of the Upanishad recognizes that despite quenching these needs, despite being virtuous, we still suffer. And the student intuitively knows that this is not what it is meant to be. Intuitively we all know that there is a happiness that is accessible, that is there for all of us to enjoy. A happiness which in the Bible is referred to as the kingdom of heaven and it's the kingdom of heaven is in us. So it's all there and yet somehow it gets eclipsed. So the student asks this basic question. What is, it that, what is it that gives us a kind of happiness which uh, endures we all together? It 
literature is what contributes to authenticer dukha nivritti a complete cessation of suffering if that is possible and paramananda prana happiness the highest happiness uh, which is always a it is with that very high noble object that we embark on this path now to really get it a uh, student has to be qualified and so has the teacher and that was how the dialogues of the upanishads uh, were unraveled they were very brief they were all dialogues they were all based on a question answer mode of operation please know here the student really wants to know it's an authentic need to know to to be what is revealed it is not motivated by the need to learn something some piece of knowledge like any other knowledge and so that for example so that we can teach it so that students can score a good marks in the examination so that we can do research and publish paper that would be more in line with artha this is called moksha it's a very profound understanding most people are scared of moksha because they think it is uh, it is other worldly but perhaps it is not so with that brief introduction let's get into the topic i have prepared some slides for us to quickly grasp uh, this in the short time that we have you are welcome to ask questions but i suggest you wait till the end so let me go into the presentation can you see the screen hello not yet sir no sir we can't see sir very now yes now it is visible sir okay can you see the whole screen uh yes sir can you see the title slide yes yes sir yes yes sir yes, sir. yes. All right. good so this is the topic that for my see what does it promise realization of who we truly are otherwise called self realization but more important freedom from ignorance freedom from suffering and freedom from limitation now the topic is part of psychology here so i am not one of you i am not a trained psychologist who i have had uh, i have a deep interest in the subject and this is my understanding of psychological well being commonly uh, the word when you say that you are consulting a psychologist at least in india that is viewed with some misgivings it seems that you have a problem uh, well the reality is all of us have problems and so the first level of understanding of psychology or psychological well being is an absence of significant disturbances like high anxiety fear depression insecurity restlessness anger jealousy suspicion etc but is for an institution it's it's good if you don't have reports of suicides and depression and people complaining but this does not imply psychological well and usually even institutions uh, go to psychologists seek counseling only if there are significant concerns very interesting what is taken as normal and granted is 
presence of normal disturbance, not significant disturbance, such as constant mental chatter, distractibility, perpetual anchoring for different objects of desire, half-hearted or lethargic engagement with life. This actually indicates a lack of well-being. But uh, this is normal. But the real cause of psychology in its true sense comes with a third understanding. It's positive signs of well-being such as equanimity, inner peace, inner security, self-confidence, sense of mastery, purposeful and joyful engagement with life. These are the true indicators of healthy psychological wealth. And it is in this direction that this presentation, this talk is directed. So let's be very clear. If you go by this third criteria, all of us need. So if we are not here to talk about how to handle people with uh, neuroses of different kinds and psychoses of different kinds which is where much of Western psychology has done good work and uh, relevant. This is a much deeper healing uh, for everybody and it actually covers the other element as well. So let me begin with a graph which really summarizes the situation. On the x-axis is the usual indicator of feeling good of doing well. So if you on the green side uh, we are performing well, if we are on the red side, on the left side, we are performing poorly. And on the y-axis we have two, uh, two levels. You have the normal working hours where we are expected to perform our jobs, where we have high energy and high arousal. And on the lower side, we have low energy and low arousal, and it's time to take rest. Within uh, uh, the human system, you have the ANS, which is the autonomic nervous system, which is said to be sympathetic when it's aroused, and when it is relaxing, it is said to be parasympathetic. Now, ideally, it is to be aroused during the working hours and it is supposed to rest into a parasympathetic mode in the evening and night times when we are taking rest. Ideally, it is to be a system that operates with balance. So that's on the green side. But often we are on the red side. That's on the left side. On the red side, we tend to be over simple, that means we are kind of hyperactive, we are stressed. That is a, a modern disease that we all suffer from. And when we go home to take rest, we are not able to take rest. We often bring the problems from work to home and sometimes we carry the problems from home to work. And so we are switched on even when we should be switched off. And so that's called a sympathetic bias. Uh, it's almost like a computer. Today, that, that's the language everybody understands, which is always switched on. And there are programs running in the background that we started, we don't even remember when we started, that are still working. And uh, the system can't really handle this effectively. The hard disk gets worn out very quickly. And it's, when it's tested, when there's a crisis, the system sometimes hangs. You know what I'm talking about. So, it's necessary to, let's say, to reboot the system periodically. But we really don't know how to do that so that the system works efficiently. What are some of the indicators of the green side, the high performance? Well, there's a sense of acceleration passion and joy. There is a feeling of love. Love not just for human or sentient
a sense of kindness and abundance, a feeling of appreciation, a feeling of harmony in our intersubjective interactions, and a real perception of beauty. There is goodness here in all senses, satyam, shivam, sundaram at play. And when we are in the parasympathetic domain, which is when we don't need to work, we feel inner peace, we feel equanimity, we have acceptance, we have forgiveness. It's a time for serenity, reflection, and then. How wonderful it would be if all of us would uh, go to operate on this side of the spectrum. Uh, there would probably be no need for psychologists, uh, which is all right, which is the best thing that could be possible, but unfortunately that is not the reality. And the reality is we are often on the red side. On the red side, we experience frustration, periodically we get angry, irritated, we feel hostility, we are afraid, we are worried about the future, real or imagined. We are anxious, we feel guilty, we are overwhelmed with stress, we feel resentful, we feel judgmental. And there is a sense of hopelessness and despair when we get home. Uh, we feel depressed, we feel burnt out easily, we feel fatigued, we feel withdrawn, and we feel that things are going downhill. That's not a good state to be. Uh, for a person with self-awareness, it's easy to recognize when these red states arise. And uh, incidentally, that red domain could vary from zero at the origin to minus infinity. And just as on the breeding side, you could move from zero to plus infinity. I have shown this slide to many audiences, of course, not, not psychologists like you, and invariably everybody agrees that we are mostly on the red side. I'm curious to know whether there's a difference when it comes to psychologists in your own personal life. Can I get some responses? Uh, are you a different species that you don't really want to be on the Sorry, I can't. Yeah, you that, that's a good admission because then you are attending sessions like this not because it's something to be taught to others, but because we ourselves need to find our way. As it is said, we have to be a light unto ourselves before we can be a light of love. So if we take this perspective, if we treat this as a universal problem, if we see this as going beyond any narrow religion, when we, if we go beyond words like Indian and Western, you find that this has always been a common problem for man. If I may say so, in the Indian wisdom tradition, the word Indian was never there. That's a modern way of doing it. And often those who are promoting the Indian tradition uh, tend to look down on the Western methods. I wouldn't do that. Everything is the unfolding of, of one cosmos. Everything is a cosmic event. It has no boundaries. That's the approach we will take. But the, the summary of this is we are suffering, whether we admit or not, and more than, and so what is required is for intelligent human beings to ask what is it that is pushing us on the red side? What are those dysfunctional habits and beliefs that are holding us there? What is it that we need to do to upgrade ourselves and consistently operate on the green side? And in the ancient Indian tradition, this came out as a mantra. It says, Om Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya. Lead us from 
Well, actually, it begins with Om Asato Ma Satka. Lead us from Asat. Asat reminds us of the word Asatya, which is close to it. But actually, Asat, in a deeper sense, refers to anything that is subject to change, that is uh, an appearance. Lead us from Asat to Sat. Sat is that which is an ever unchanging truth, a reality, a being. Asato ma satkame. Tamaso ma jyotirgame. Tamas is darkness and jyoti is light. Lead us from darkness to enlightenment. Mrityo ma amritam game. Mrityo here is not just death, it's it's depression, it's going downhill, it's uh, almost like death. And Amritam is immortality. Amritam also means uh, a nectar. nectar. So it's happiness all the way. Now, when Christ said the kingdom of heaven is in you, and when we, when, for example, even uh, even uh, Mystics like Kabir said, Kasturi Kundal Basen. I hope you remember that Doha we learned in school. Kasturi Kundal Basen. Mrid Dunhe Vanuma. Kasturi is a fragrance, uh, it's a scent that is available now as a perfume. It is extracted from the entrails, the intestine of the species of deer, the Kasturi Man. And the, in the poet's imagine, imagination, this uh, fragrance he can be felt. That fragrance, that amruta, uh, the dear things comes from the surroundings, from the forest. Kasturi kundal basen rivit dunde van maati. Aise ghat ghat ram hai. Ram here means happiness. Aise ghat ghat ram hai. Look at this. Kabir was a person who transcended religious values. Dunya dekhe na. Like this, all the happiness, all the fulfillment that we seek is already within us. And yet we search for it endlessly in the world also. Now, it is here, at least in the context of the word sat. Jyoti that I would like to bring in the topic Tathvamasi. Tathvamasi is called the Mahavakta. Literally a great sentence which actually conveys the essence of the entire Upanishad, the entire wisdom of the Vedantic tradition. Um, Vedanta because it's at the end of the Vedas. And here, actually, the exploration is in, in the domain of moksha, seeking liberation, uh, transcending artha, kama, and dharma. And once clear realized, when you go back to the karma kanda, it's a liberated being engaging in the world. Imagine how that would play out. That would be high performance on the green side, always consistent. Rarely slipping off the rails. So the, this Mahavakya appears in an Upanishad called the Chandogya Upanishad in the sixth chapter. And the story goes there was a Rishi called Shvetakil who had a son. A son in Rishi's name was Uttalaka. The son's name was Shvetakil. And uh, he didn't pay particular attention to the son till the son came of the age of eight and then he realized the boy needed to learn. But he didn't want to teach his own son. So he sent his son to a neighboring Gurukula where the son learned for 16 years. And when the boy returns at around the age of 24, the father has only one thought in mind. Has my son realized? See, that was straight away the objective of life. It is not, it is, has my son understood 
ज्योति सब इनाम इज माई सन रियलाइज एंड वन लुक एट द सन एंड द फादर गुड इन चूट सो द father asks his son did you to ask for this knowledge from your teacher and the son looks blank so the father asks him several questions the son answers correctly but he could sense that the son has the arrogance of knowing which many of us academics share we know but really the thing that we ought to know the understanding of jyoti satya namrutam that we don't know we know many other things sim the father can see and the father asks the son the son realizes he doesn't father asks him do you want that's when the son lowers his head and admits and he says yes i want and so there are many short stories given i'll give you just one of them the father says and they are seated under the huge banyan tree father asks son tell me how does this how did this banyan tree emerge the son unhesitatingly gives the correct answer from a seed father is then very good and this is experimentation father says let's take a look at the seed can you climb this tree and pull out the fruit it's a berry that you get The son does that. The father says, "Break the fruit and show me a seed." And the son breaks the fruit and pulls out a small seed. Then the father said, "Are you telling me that from this small seed, this fruit tree has emerged? What's the secret? Let's explore. Break the seed and tell me what's the secret inside." The son. <laughs> it is taken aback he's never done this kind of experimentation but he dutifully does as told breaks the seed and looks inside and the father says report to me what you see son doesn't know what to say but he says i can't see anything and then the father closes his eyes pauses in meditation and tells his son from that apparent nothingness this whole tree has emerged from that nothingness apparent nothingness you and i and this whole world has emerged and into that apparent nothingness everything goes man that that unchanging substrate that stuff that you are that that from you i see that's the topic we are exploring coming back to suffering the buddha's first noble truth which we all know see buddha when he was young itself recognized the real problem the human problem what is the noble truth of suffering birth is suffering aging is suffering sickness is suffering dissociation from the loved is suffering not to get what one wants is suffering. in other words whenever something happens contrary to our expectation whenever people behave in a manner contrary to our liking whenever things happen that we don't want to happen happen we suffer we are unhappy with whatever is unfolding in the present moment and we resist it and we imagine that happiness lies somewhere in the future we are looking for ways to access it why do we suffer and the buddha 
was a very keen psychologist. You must realize that the entire Indian psychology was not based on uh, behaviorism, not based on third party understanding, was not based on conducting research, taking statistics and finding a pattern in that behavior. The method of research was very simple. It was going by your own personal experience and realizing that is the experience of everybody else. So it's an experimentation within once, by once, in once. We'll go into deeper to that topic a while later. But the first thing the Buddha observed, whether you look inward or you outward, is everything is subject to change. Ever change. Everything that is manifest is ever changing. And if we take the meaning of Sat as ever unchanging truth, all that we see and experience will come under the category of Asat. But it's always changing. And so he said this in his own way. He said, Anityam, Anityam, Sarvam, Anityam. Anityam, not Nityam, not changeless, not permanent, but all transient. And because we don't like that, especially when the knowing is good. Uh, and he also went one step further. He said, the world and people and things that we take to be solid, they are not what they appear to be. The world is not what it appears to be. This is something which even modern physics <laughs> testifies because if you go to subatomic level, you, you uh, like Shweta Ketu discovered, you really don't see anything. It's all empty space out there. If you go to outer space also, it's all empty space out there. It's 99.9999% empty. So, he saw this clearly and that's how he came up with the next powerful statement. He said, Shunyam, Shunyam, Sarvam Shunyam. So, the, the Saf we used to, if you wish to retain the use of the word sat, is something that is formless, that has the potential to manifest any form. But whatever is manifested has a birth and a death. And if you cannot accept that truth, you will suffer. And the suffering is a consequence of it. So he ended up by saying, Dukkham, Dukkham, Sarvam, Dukkham. Now this theme of suffering has been explored in world literature. And one of the quotes that I'd like to give is from Henry David Thoreau, who put it beautifully, the American writer. He said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Look at that language, quiet desperation. It's, it's so subtle, but it's always there. And we are willing, unwilling to accept it. Well, is there a better way to live? That is what we will explain. So, in self inquiry, we are looking into ourselves. We define, and all of us think we are the body. The self here is called the jiva, and the skin in which we think the body is body is our boundary, and we, anything outside we see as the world. Me and not me, and that world, the whole landscape. The whole cosmos outside is called Jagat. Very simple. If we go by this definition, then the problem is the self is finite, is limited, and it suffers from this sense of lack and unease because it experiences, as the Buddha pointed out, Anityam, Anityam, Sarva, Anityam, Shunyam, Shunyam, Sarva, Shunyam. That, of course, may not be understood by all, but definitely Dukham, Dukham, Sarva, Dukham. So, we all feel this. And to overcome this sense of lack and unease and boredom, what do we do? We look for happiness. Where do we look? We look into the world. Because that's the only thing that is there other than the unhappy self. And that's what we do. We look for objects promising happiness. What are these objects? 
So we have this subject, and there are these objects out there. They could be material objects, they could be uh, academic degrees, it's all Arka. They could be uh, relationships, they could be activities, they could be substances, they could be uh, addictions, whatever. There are things that promise happiness, and so we reach out to them, we feel attracted to them. And that attraction is called raga. So I also bring in simple terms. We feel a raga, an attraction and an attachment. And uh, we go after them. And we have already discussed this. They are driven by the need for artha, kama and dharma. These are the three purusharthas, uh, the objectives of human living apparently. And yes, we struggle hard and we do get those objects. Well, nothing lasts. Okay. This outward movement is called pravritti. Vritti literally means a movement, a vibration. Pravritti means a movement outward. We are relentlessly active, you know, involved in pravritti. Our minds are always moving up. And if you look at the five senses, the eyes are also poised outward. They, they don't look inward, they look outward with ears and nose, etc. So it's, it's natural that we look outward for everything, even our thoughts move outward. And then we acquire these objects, they give us temporary happiness, and as you know very well, that happiness does not last long. And often it turns to its opposite. Take, typically, relationships take uh, the classic concept of falling in love. Sometimes we fall in love and then uh, later we are disappointed and uh, love turns to hate sometimes, often. And then uh, the girl who would ask, what the hell did I see in this guy in the first place? Well, we see what promises happens, what drives the dopamine in our brains. And uh, it's not as though the other person has changed. It's just that we didn't see the big picture. And we invested our happiness on an external object, and no external object is nithya, it is anithya, it changes. So this is a very important point. So if you look deeper, we run after happiness in objects, believing the happiness lies there in the object. If you're a little scientific and logical in your understanding, if uh, happiness is a property of an object, it should be there all the time. And it should be equally attractive to everybody who sees it. But that is not so. We know that very well. So where does the happiness come from? This is important. Maybe the happiness is actually in us, as Jesus pointed out or as Kabir points out, Maybe it's in here and it's somehow reflected in the object. And yes, when there's a union, that's yoga, when the subject and the object become one. When I acquire the cell phone that I desperately wanted or when I unite with my partner or whatever, there is definitely a blissful experience of happiness. It doesn't last long. It's as though it's as though the, the, the unhappiness disappeared, and this is a deeper understanding. So it's not that um, happiness is intrinsic to the object. It's not that um, we want security. Maybe it is we want freedom from insecurity. It's not that we want pleasure, want karma. Maybe. It's because we want freedom from craving, freedom from boredom. Maybe it's not a desire to be good. Maybe it's freedom from the sense of being bad or feeling guilty. It's, it's essentially a, a freedom from the subjective sense of limitation that the object points to. This is a real deeper understanding. And when you do that, you will realize that what we really want to discover is the happiness that is already there within us. 
and this is exposed, this truth is exposed when we start feeling aversion, dvesha, when we have ill will, when we have hatred, and when we feel fear, higher. We feel fear that the happiness will not last, we are afraid that things will happen in the future that uh, are not going to be good. And so we go through this cycle, it's an endless cycle. From lack and unease, a movement outward, gravity towards objects promising happiness, getting happiness for some time, and then going back to lack and unease. This cycle, well acknowledging the Indian tradition, this uh, merry-go-round, which uh, more appropriately is called sorry-go-round, is called samsara, the cycle of, endless cycle of essentially of suffering and then escape from suffering and a return to suffering. This is the reality of life. Now, in the beginning we don't see this, you know, the honeymoon period of life when we are young, we don't feel this much, but it starts pinching up to a certain point. Then you get fed up. It is then that you say, there must be a better way to live. And when you do that, you you drop this project. What is the project? The daily project. You recognize the daily project is this cycle, managing despair, and you're looking for the real solution. The real solution does not come from probability, and you recognize, and thanks to the words of enlightened people, you recognize that the root cause is ignorance. It's called avidya, and that deep-rooted ignorance lies from really not knowing who I am. This is the fundamental definition of Abhidhya. Not knowing who I am and mistaking myself for who I am really not. So this search for discovering who I am I is now a new direction to take. It's an opposite direction. We are not looking outward at the world. Mind you, the entire psychology that you are, uh, you are dealing with is all about navigating in the transactional world out there. That's from the Vyavaharic world. But if you want to discover who we truly are, then it has to be inward. Paramarthic, that's the word. It's a spiritual psychology we need, and then we can go back to the world outside, so far outside. So this is the fourth Purushartha. Moksha, which is really what we all want, but we are looking in the other direction. And moksha literally is liberation. It's freedom from ignorance, suffering, and limitation. So here, the problem of unease and lack came because we identified with a separate self, a body and a mind, which is finite, which feels limited, and suddenly you realize you are not that, you are much bigger, you are the whole. So, we begin with where we are. We are identified here with the body, we feel we are inside the body, and the world is out there. And there is a transaction going on. Let's take perception. To begin with, let's take visual perception. There is an object out there to be perceived. Right now, all of you are looking at your laptop or phone. You are looking at a screen. That is what you are perceiving. How are you perceiving this? through the agency of the eye. Now science tells us that it, it's not the eye that's perceiving it, it's the retina and the convex lens in the front which takes the image and passes it on to the retina. And if you really study science properly, you will. it's a question that you could have posed to your science teacher that the image is always inverted and diminished. Do you remember? Now, what the hell does that mean? Does it mean that the real world out there is ulta, upside down, and it's much bigger than what it is? Then sometimes it's not quite don't see the image. You see, uh, you don't see the object, or you see an image because the rods and cones, the optic nerves at the back of the retina, transmit a signal which is decoded in some area of the brain, and you see an image. Now the word image comes from imagination. 
image is clearly more thought like than matter like and then we conjecture we expolate that there must be a real material world out there which we are seeing but if we go strictly by our own experience mind you the opinions insist go by your experience but that's all you have we have to admit that what we see is a world that is more mind like than matter like and so the opinion the mandokya opinion for example says is it different from what you see in a dream when in a dream you yourself create the whole world and you experience it as as being real so the first point to note in self inquiry is the world is very different it is what we see is our own imagined reality and maybe there is a solid reality out there we are not denying that and there is some something to that because the optimal just teaches that if your vision is blurred or not good you can correct your vision by uh, putting lenses that's all true so there is something out there so called out there but really what we experience is in there now this can be extended to every sense perception hearing touching we only experience the in our minds now, as psychologists have we ever really grasped this the whole world we experience world of perception is experienced mentally and uh, that's when mind and matter come in it's more mind than matter here when it comes to self experience and whatever is said to be purely mental which are thoughts and desires and feelings and imaginations uh, they come not from outside they come from within they are triggered from within and uh, in the indian tradition we use terms like antahkarana ina instruments which are four fold there is the mind proper the sense mind manas then there is the chitta which is the memory bank with which you relate to whatever you see there is the buddhi which discriminates and processes what you see and there is the ahankara which takes possession of what you see so this is mind and after there and so you have thoughts and emotions all are experienced within and sensations of the body all are experienced in this domain which we call chitta akasha akasha means space so the mind scape chitta is a broad word for mind the mind scape is where we experience everything and we conjecture that the world the material world world of the five bhutas today you can talk of 120 odd elements of the periodic table it's all the same that material world is called bhut akasha bhut akasha bhut akasha is actually experienced in chitta akasha and in nivritti you realize that even chitta akasha is experienced in a, a realm of consciousness aware presence and that is called chitta akasha i want you to get a taste of this by closing your eyes listen to the sounds that you experience the sound of my voice i can hear the sound of the clock ticking in the room the sound of birds traffic the sound of crickets in the forest all these sounds arise in some space which we can call sound space or sound scape there is the sound of the aeroplane aeroplane is not conjecture there is a sound and that vibration quietens down and goes back to the silence So there's a deep silence in which all this is played out. Now I want you to think of something. Think of 
a topic like Indian psychology. That's thought. It's an abstract thought. Your thoughts also arise in some space. They are sustained for some time by the chain of thinking. They recede and subside into what space? It's a space of awareness. Everything is playing out in a space of awareness. Now go back to hearing the sound. And I want you to ask this question yourself. Are you switching from one space to another space or is it just one single space of awareness in which sounds are experienced, sensations are experienced, thoughts are experienced, all these arise and sustain If I ask you a simple question, are you aware? Your answer, I would assume, is yes. This is so obvious. Did you need the body or the mind to certify this or was it a wordless, obvious, self-evident truth? There is a aware presence which is self-aware, independent of the body mind instrument, which actually sees it, which witnesses it. That is what Tatvamati points out. Okay, you can open your eyes and look again to the next slide. When we talk of interrelationships, me here, eventually I believe I am in here inside my body mind and you are out there inside your body mind. And uh, we have an interaction. I have opinions about you, but really you are an image. And I have an idea of you, which I think you are. And that's the big mistake we make because we don't know. It. And my idea of you may be good you are a good person, especially if you think well of me and sing my praises and dance to my tunes. And you are a horrible person if you do the opposite. And it can keep changing. So that's how the transactional world is. It's a finite, limited, partial, biased understanding of the world. So the same is true of my idea of the world. It's all happening in here, in a limited domain, which is conditioned, which is biased which is governed by a set of beliefs. First belief is I am this body, which are really not true. So that's all in the realm of Chitta Asha. But if you see it from the perspective of the true witness, in which all this drama is unfolding, that is the domain of Chitta Asha. So there is an ever unchanging reality. See, the witness is not affected by whatever is witnessed. Whatever is witnessed is multifarious, but that which is witnessing is not affected. It's like the movie screen, in which all kinds of movies play out, but the screen is never perfect. Or it's like the space in this room, which is not affected by what kind of things you put in, what people come in or go out, good people, bad people, whether the, you have kind thoughts or you have unkind thoughts, the space is not. So Chita Akasha is all allowing, all permitting, it's ever unchanging reality, it's the sense of who you are, and it is self-aware. Awareness brings in knowledge, jnana, and presence brings in being. So that's what we are, we are beings, and the human part of it comes later. Witnessing the Chitta Vritti, Chitta Vritti is a vibration that is experienced that is seen to arise in this self-aware presence of Chidakasha. Uh, and 
it is sustained, it's ever changing, and it subsides. So that's clearly the mind. But the Bhutakash, and you see the body and the world always appear together, they are seen appearing in Chittakash. But the whole thing is sustained by Chittakash. The common Swarupa, the stuff of everything that arises, must be awareness. Why? Because there is no other material. The thought, where did it start from? Where did the image come from? It came in awareness. It is seen from awareness and it is made of awareness. So that is by default also called Sat Chit I am the witness ever unperturbed. And in the Gita, the word uses Om Vasudeva Sarvapi. Vasudeva, many people limit to the idea of a deity, Krishna. No, but Vasudeva literally means that deity, that divinity which is whose nivas is everywhere. Sarva. Another Upanishadic statement is Isha Vasim Idam Sarva. Now we all believe that we are so and so. Okay, so there is the aware presence which doesn't believe anything. There is this body mind. And out of ignorance, we identify, we misidentify with who this body is. And that superimposition for us. And so the unconditioned true self narrows down to a finite apparent ego self. And Suddenly, the aware presence is born. Uh, if you take Shankara's Tattva Bodha, classically he talks of six moments uh, the body goes through. First, the body is conceived in the mother's womb, Asti, and then it is born as a baby, Jayate, and it grows, Bhartate, then Viparinamate, it starts uh, uh, reaching its post maturity. Apakshyate, it decays, and Vinashyate, it perishes, it dies. The Deha is linked to the word Dakyate, which means it's going to be burnt in the old English tradition. So, suddenly you are identified with earth, with age, the so conscious of the looks, you feel bad when the wrinkles appear on the face, when the hair grays, and when the hair itself disappears and becomes bald. Because we are so attached to this identity. Something that is unconditioned believes it to be completely conditioned and seeks happiness in that which is not. It has a gender, certainly mother, male, female, transgender, feminist, whatever. And you have color, black or white or in between or whatever. You are experience sickness and death and this is this beautiful line in the Gita which says if you really knew who you were you will realize that weapons do not cut it, fire does not burn it, water does not wet it nor does wind uh, dry it. We, many people read all the but completely get it. We are that aware presence in which all this unfolds that aware presence doesn't have any caste, either forward or backward, doesn't have any religion, this is mind-blowing. First, you have to take on the identity of a being, a human being. And then you have to take on the identity of sex. Then you have to take on the identity of religion and nationality and whatnot. You have relations and you have possessions, blood relations. All this is coming with the identity, identity of I and the body. And once that misidentification takes place, then you will suffer the consequences. You will have lust, karma, anger, krodha when you don't get what you want. Loba, you have greed, you have delusion, moha, you have pride and arrogance to mother, and you have envy and jealousy also. So this self-aware presence. If you really get it, Aham Brahmasmi becomes identified with something, X, and, it's, and the whole ignorance starts. X could be this body, this mind, 
even the ego. See, you can see the ego also objectively. In self-awareness, sometimes you say, yes, in my earlier times I was very egoistic. Now I am not that much. How do you say that? Because you can see that in the now. It's not who you truly are. It's called an upadhi, which means a disguise, a costume. It's a, a means, also an instrument to help you recognize who you are. And when you say, I am suffering, I am feeling depressed, I am feeling agitated, you really are saying that you are not suffering, if you can do self inquiry You are saying the costume you are wearing is suffering. That is feeling depressed. Why? Because I can see it as an object. Who is seeing? The witness is not what is witnessed. So you cannot be what you see. This is the real freedom from suffering, because you are the ever unchanging self, ever at peace, having no boundaries, in which lots of things manifest, perceptions, sensations, thoughts, emotions, they are like a movie which play out, and uh, they come and go. So, you don't say, I am so and so, I am a professor, this is my name, I am a psychologist, I teach this, no. That's a role you play. I am aware of this unfolding in awareness. That's all we can say. This is a way we can Whatever arises will pass away. Whatever is born will finish. Can I take some more time? Or are you tight on the schedule? Yes, sir. We can have a few more minutes, sir. Okay, because uh, you know, this is not an easy topic to cover very quickly. And if you really want to get it, we have to go on. So there's this lovely line in the Gita. Uh, especially I want you to note the words Nirmamo Nirahankar. Nirmamo. The real understanding points to be free from the notion of mine. I have a car. I say my car for functional purposes. Nama, Rupa, Vyabhara. I give it a name, it has a form, and it has a function. I drop the car, I look through the window, and I see the world outside. But I am never deluded in thinking that I am the car. Even when the car is dented, yes, I feel a, a, a little pain in my mind, but I am not dented. Are you understanding what I am saying? Now, I take care of the car, I clean it, I maintain it. That's exactly how I should take care of the instrument that I am associated with in the body and the mind. Never having this delusion of mama, mind, and ahankar. I am a caretaker as long as it's given to my charge. Nirahankar, I, so freedom from I and mind. But really it goes all the way. The whole verse is atveshta. Freedom from Vesha, infinite. Sarva Bhutana, all beings, all sentient beings, not just human beings. Sarva Bhutana, Maitra, a sense of kinship which naturally comes because everything is, is arising in me, it's all made of me. Advesta, Sarva Bhutana, Maitra, Karuna, compassion naturally arises. Maitra, Karuna, Evach. Nirmamo Nirahankara Sama Dukha Sukha So the ability to see all the Chitta Vrittis even the reactions, the conditioned reactions of Dukha and Sukha which are arising in the instrument, in the mind but I am not the mind, I am with the mind That to see with an equal eye is possible only from the witness stand Sama Dukha Sukha Seeing it equally Shami and therefore being able to to forgive, to let go, not to nurture grievances. You see how powerful this is. This is real healing. This is real understanding. This is transformative. So there is this formless aware presence and I am aware of this material universe, the jigat, which is arising in my understanding and the body arises when I wake up in the morning, both the awareness of the body and the world arise simultaneously. 
but they are all arising as chitta vrittis in my mind. The only stuff there is is being awareness, limitless. There is no boundary to this. Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma is the description given in the Taitriya Upanishad. I, I, I won't go deeper into that. And uh, so it's formless. See, anything that is limitless has to be formless. And its essence is Satsachitananda, it's uh, Swarupa. And there's this lovely line in the Gita which says, That which is Nasato Vidyate Bhava never ceases to exist, it's ever unchanging. And that which is not, Asat, never comes to be. And that's the essence of that for us. I want to give you a quote from Ramana Maharshi, who is one of the great natural exponents of this understanding. Self taught at the age of 16, didn't go through any teachers, but he discovered from a death experience that this is true. Everyone is aware of two things, namely himself or herself, the seer, the witness, and the world which he or she sees. He assumes that they are both real, but that alone is real, which has a continuous existence. Judged by this test, the two, the seer and the spectacle, are both unreal. These two appear intermittently. In other words, anything that lasts, that can be seen and that vanishes, is, according to a strict definition of reality, unreal. But you can give it a relative reality, a dependent reality. What you see, what you experience, is dependent on the one who experiences it. They are apparent in the waking and dream states alone. In the state of deep sleep, they cease to appear. That is, they appear when the mind is active and disappear as soon as the mind ceases to function. Therefore, the two are but thoughts of the mind. There must be something from which the mind arises and it itself. It's, that something must have continuous, ever changing reality. I, I'd like to bring in the metaphor of play. So, why did this manifestation take place? Why did it create two things? There are many interpretations, but the one that I like is the concept of play or leela. And uh, Alan Watts put it this way in a, in a kind of a story form for children. See, there was this awareness, if you like God, formless, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, capable of anything, but formless. And this awareness was created by for fun, to play. Now, to play you need at least two people, right? So, if I create a clone of myself, and that clone is equally omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, then there's no fun. The fun is when you don't know. And since awareness is all powerful, uh, the secret, in the game of hide and seek that we play, right, lies precisely when you don't know. That's how Abhidhya comes into play. So, you don't know. Abhidhya is deliberately blocked, not in and then you, you enjoy it for a while. After a certain time, you realize that there is a deeper meaning to this game. And then you want to really wake up. And it's then that you really awaken. And not everybody awakens. You can see for sure that only few awaken. But when you go back to playing the game, it's not the same view. It's an awakening. Shakespeare put it beautifully. He had an intuition and insight to this. He says, all the world's a stage and all the men and women are players. They have their exits and their entrances. So, if you want to watch a play or uh, come to a theater, you can experience the power of that scenario. Or it could be the privacy of your own home or your house in these lockdown times when you watch Netflix or whatever uh, TV. The first thing you experience is there's a feeling of spaciousness, there's a distance between the witness and what is witnessed. So that the drama is playing out there, it could be a terrible drama, somebody getting killed, it could be a horror movie, whatever. But I, the witness, am safe in here because it's a movie playing there. You know, I'm not really affected, I can enjoy it. That's the essential understanding. And then 
a black really is able to make you sit at the edge of your seat with the power of depiction. So there are these beautiful rasas that play. The problem is, let's say your, you know, ideally you would like to have the shingar or hasya rasa with your partner or even your employee or, or boss. But then uh, if your your partner is perpetually giving you a raudra rasa or a bhayanaka or a vibhatsa, then it's, it's uh, not easy. But once you realize this is just a game, it's, 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 and there's a joy in playing in the different people. There are these uh, lovely serials, uh, you know, very popular. There's a Ramayana serial. You have a character of Ravana in Rama. On stage, uh, they really convince us that one person is totally evil and the other is a noble lord. But backstage, these actors are good friends and they shake hands. When you go to the green room, so do we have a green room in our lives where we can really see and enjoy the whole movie, or do we really mistake appearance or reality? That green room is Chidakash, in which we need to enter. Here we are the one actor playing many roles. Uh, some of them are conflicting, you can see here. And uh, unless we realize that they are roles, they are costumes that we wear, and we are supposed to take off the costume once the role is done, we are going to be afflicted, attached. We won't be able to play the role. Another meaning for playing is playing pleasure for fun. There is a game of Monopoly where lots of things happen, you win, you lose. But you realize it's all paper money, but when you're a kid, you don't realize that it's all life and death that you hate it when you lose and your, your partner is building a lot of houses and making a lot of money, or you're going to jail or paying income tax, and whatever. So the elders know how to play this and they don't mind losing. Why? Because it's all, it's all for fun. Can we play life like that? That is actually what the Gita points out. Sukra dukhe same kritva, lava, lava, jaya, jaya. Treat alike pleasure and pain, gain and loss, victory and beauty. So, equanimity arises from this deeper understanding where we are the ever unchanging reality, the tap, in which everything is playing out. So, you have the waking world. First act is when you wake up, you will suddenly wake up and the whole world comes alive. And uh, the Bhutakash and Chittakash are already right there. And then the, you get tired, the body gets tired after working the whole day and you want to go to sleep. When you sleep, act two starts and then the mind is not tired, mind is still active. So Chittakash is still alive and you have dreams, sometimes horrible dreams, sometimes nice dreams. It's only when you wake up you realize it's not real, it's just a dream. The interesting thing about the dream world is you create the whole world. Because you have the power, you are awareness after all. You created the whole world, then the big thing of that, but you chose to identify with one character out there, and you are looking through the eyes of that character and experiencing the world. And the reality is, the world out there, and the world in here, in that dream character, is all playing out in the mind of the person who is sleeping in the bed and playing the whole game. And then when the mind is also tired, you get into act three, which is deep sleep, so shifty. And there you experience the bliss of quietude, happiness, ananda. That's when, see, you are not dead. Something is there. Something that picks up the alarm rings in the morning. Who is that? That is awareness. And the term used in the literature is Sushupta, the Atman that alone is there in Sushupti. But it must be there even in the green world, even in the world, we always there. And that is who we are. That is also called Nirguna Brahma. And the other thing is all Sabuna Brahma. I don't have time for the story, so let me just move on. So we are this background awareness. If you have that understanding, not just in moments of meditation when you can abide in formless aware presence, but also when things play out in your life, 
you don't lose that awareness, then you advance to this understanding of Chutya Dutta, where everything is playing out beautifully. So, classically, in today's understanding, we have the world of mind, we have the world of matter. In the approach of the Indian wisdom traditions, we say matter is also projection in the mind, so we need to work with the mind. The main differences are mind is very subtle, matter is physical, gross, mind points to the subjective realm, matter points to the objective realm. Why in psychology the subject because stop with the mind. We don't go deeper into the source from which mind emerges. That is the ultimate subject. We use the word internal and external, we use the word perceived and perceived. And there's this impression between two worlds. Now, traditionally we use the word idealist when you believe that mind is the only reality. The word of the matter is protection. And this is from our experience. Nobody can deny that. And we take this path and we have a book in mind. But in the Western world and in science, it's not wrong to take matter as the only reality. That's a realist view. But the fact that, and if you take this view, you are keen on knowing the laws governing nature. Except that in Indian tradition also included the mind and the ego, the entire antakarana also as part of prakriti. It's also a movement of one nature. And this is needed if you want to understand what's going on. But the fact that they interact suggests that there are no two realities of purusha and prakriti. They all come from one reality, the outline reality, and that one, not two, non dual, is called Advaita. Formless aware presence is the only reality. So, this is all inclusive, and there's no conflict between all of these. You can take any point of view that you like, it's all playing out in Chila. Formless aware presence is the only reality. In this, everything plays out. So, if you are in a meeting and you take the position of one of the players, it's always good to know it's the six blind men looking at the elephant. You know the story. So, uh, each one of us is conditioned by our beliefs, our conditioning, our background. And when I say that the elephant is a snake because it looks like that, the person at the other end said, no, the elephant is a rope because he's holding the snake. The, the tail. Th this deeper understanding allows us to realize that the other perspective could be equally valid. You see is only a limited perspective and it's possible to step back and allow everything to proceed. And that is the perspective of the one form of awareness. And who is that ultimate in-person perceiver? Then we So life is a beautiful flow. We see everything unfolding in its own natural way. Can we be open to whatever presents itself in the moment? Welcome, never arise it. Not resist it, not cling to it, and see it off as it leaves, can we see that the flow flows from the same? I don't make it flow, nor can I prevent it. Can I see that this has always been the case? Whenever I thought that I was a doer or discipline maker, I thought I interfered with the flow. But that interference was also perhaps part of the flow, a single unfolding cosmic event. Separating the interference of the word, action or decision from the flow is not real, it's just my imagination. There's no separation. There's no one controlling the flow. The flow controls itself. No one contemplates itself. The beholder of the flow is like 
the imagined controller. It's also not separate. Because perception requires contact, connection between the perceived and the perception. The understanding is also part of the truth. Separation is a myth, never existed. The myth of the myth. Now, this is the root problem we suffer from, pointed out by the Gita. We really think that we are separate doers, not recognizing that it's all flowing on its own. The cosmic flow. Prakrite. Actions are entirely done by the modes of Tribuna nature. Ahankara vimudhatma kartaham iti anya. But the deluded ego self, the so called I, imagines foolishly I am. So I don't have time for this story. I want to thank you all. Uh, for being here and uh, just to let you know that uh, in IIT Madras we have sessions like this and uh, some books have come out you can see them if you wish to. But I'll stop now and take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much sir. That was indeed a very engaging and informative session which started